Are you looking for an easy, smooth, fast, tanky and fun bow league starter? Then you've stumbled into the right video. Hey all and welcome back to Fuzzy Dutchy Gaming and my Raider Rainer Barrows build guide for 323 Affliction. For those that don't know my content, I've played Reign of Arrows at League Start since 320, and it's been an absolute blast to play on a budget every single time. This is going to be a very detailed build guide into the skill and the ascendancy, but feel free to use the timestamps to skip or come back to relevant sections. There is also a ton of material on my channel for Reign of Arrows and Raider, and most of it is still relevant as the build has gone through very few fundamental changes in the last three to four leagues. If you are new to following my builds, there's also a comprehensive written guide that will be linked in the video description, along with act by act POBs, crafting notes and anything that you need to get yourself to red maps nice and comfortably. Now this build is going to cover the following topics on screen. Firstly, what we're going to do is talk about why Raider and why Reign of Arrows works so well as a combo and also who the build might suit in regards to play styles. So let's firstly talk about why Raider and this one is going to be very very quick. It is insane out of the blocks for a league starter in terms of speed, quality in life and defences. So when you get through your campaign and into maps you're already going to have Perma Onslaught. From the tree alone and this notable you're going to have a 100% chance to suppress spell damage and you're going to have phasing. With a pair of 1C unique boots added on, you're then going to have a 100% chance to avoid elemental ailments and you're going to be able to apply 20% exposure to elemental resistances. Once you get Uber Lab, you get a ton of increased onslaught effect and 10% more chance to evade attacks during onslaught. What this means is once you've got your Uber Lab done with very basic gear, you're going to have 95% chance to evade attacks, 100% chance to suppress all spell damage, including physical, phasing to move through enemies, and then ailment avoidance so you don't get shocked, chilled, or ignited. The only thing that realistically is going to kill this build is heavy damage over time or physical damage from attacks. With the attack damage, once you get options to craft, you're going to be able to put physical taken as elemental on your chest and a helmet, which basically massively increases the physical hit that you can take, and you're only going to take 1 in 20 hits from attacks, I have leveled this build in various scenarios up to 95 super smoothly with very few deaths. In terms of Reign of Arrows as a skill, the main reason we're using it is it doesn't rely on bow mechanics such as pierce, chain or fork. Reign of Arrows just works out the box and there isn't really anything you can do to it to make the skill better or worse. That is both a pro and a con. It's a pro at league start because it, it, it as I say, just works on any ascendancy and you don't need to add things to it to get it to function. Where it comes as a con is it is very hard to scout end game because there isn't much you can do to improve the skill. But the idea of this build guide is to have a character that costs very little currency to get your first two void stones, clear your atlas. Then you're going to put a little more currency into it, get your third and fourth void stone, and then you can farm whatever you like on the atlas to get currency to progress into another build. The only thing I would say is this is not a build I would recommend trying to scale to the moon. If you just want to play one character, a league, and you really want to min-max it, this probably isn't the character to play. But it transitions really well into other bow builds such as Tornado Shot or other Raider builds such as Deck Stacking or Frenzy Stacking. This is a really good way to get your Raider leveled up, geared, and swimming in currency. Also has the benefit of having a vile version of the skill, which is super handy. What this does is maims and causes more target to bosses, and it slows them insanely. It makes bossing very, very safe because the main will last for 6 to 12 seconds and in that time you'll have killed the boss. And for most bosses, they won't even attack you because they won't get into their first phase because of the slows that you're putting on the enemy. In terms of 323 changes, there's no changes really that affect the build negatively. Val Renivers has had its quality change. So previously it was increased area of effect, which you don't actually want because it actually gimps your single target a little bit. What it's going to do now is fire 0-4 additional arrows. It sounds amazing, but it doesn't really do much for a single target because the arrows tend to fall outside of your main cone. But what it does do is make clear better, which is always a good thing. Overall, it's still a super solid skill on a very, very reliable ascendancy for league starting. So let's quickly talk about how to level and progress the build through the campaign and early maps. 
This is covered in more detail in the written guide in the POB. What we are doing in terms of ascendancy order is you're taking rapid assault first. Getting onslaught in the campaign just feels really, really good. Second half of Axe, you're going to take Quartz Infusion and then Avatar of the Veil to shore up all of your defenses. And then when you get to sort of yellow maps and get your first lab trial, you're going to go and get Avatar of the Chase. In terms of leveling in the campaign, I recommend rushing to Precise Technique and taking some Accuracy Nodes. Precise Technique is huge damage early on. It gives you 40% more attack damage if Accuracy is higher than your life. As long as you take the Accuracy Mastery that gives you plus 500 Accuracy, you're going to be fine until level 60 or 70 when you might need to start adding things like Precision or Accuracy into the build. For extra damage, you can take Point Blank if you don't mind being up close and personal to enemies, but this is optional. I personally would take it because I think Single Target is more a thing that this build is lacking, but it's totally up to your personal preference. You're going to basically run this precise technique version until mid-level 80s, getting into yellow maps. I would recommend transitioning to crit once you've got your Uber Lab out of the way or just before you do it. Once you've got enough points on the tree to allocate a lot of the crit nodes, it's much, much better to transition to crit than stay on precise technique. Again, this is covered in detail in the written guide and the POB, but there is never really a wrong time to switch. I would just say the earlier you switch, Probably the less well the build will perform straight away, but it makes the switch easier. There are no nodes that make or break the build, so you're going to run Rain of Arrows as soon as you get access to it at level 12, and that's going to be your skill until you decide to play a different character or you hang up your boots for the league. There is going to be a detailed section later in the video that is actually me going through white, yellow and red maps on a very basically geared character, to give everyone an idea of exactly how the build was performed. There is nothing I hate more than clickbaity or false league start videos. This just has the evidence that if you gear it sensibly, you are going to get this performance in white maps, this performance in yellow maps, and this performance in red maps. And I think it's something that's going to help players decide whether the build is for them or not. So let's move on to the gear. This is just a guide. There are things you can do with gear to get more DPS, more life, more resistances, but I'm just going to go for what I recommend for a well-rounded character. So we'll start with the helmet, and I recommend you go for a lion pelt because it's the biggest evasion base that you can. You want item level preferably to be 78 plus at least, and the stats we're looking for are big life and then resistances. Along with this, we want an open prefix, to craft physical damage taken as fire. This is unlocked from Corel in Syndicate. Very, very useful for our defenses since we don't have any fizz mitigation. For your implicits, just rolling with lessers is fine. You want to get reduced mana cost of attacks with Exarch and each of worlds you want fizz damage taken as either cold, fire or lightning. So moving on to the body armor, the way I like to craft these is have no life modifiers on them so that I can use the mastery to get 15% more life. So what you want to do is roll these with dense fossils. They'll be very cheap, and this makes sure that evasion rolls and life doesn't. You wait until you get half decent evasion rolls with an open prefix, and then you craft fizz taken as elemental. Any big suffixes that you get can be a help for resistances, but you should be able to cut your resistances elsewhere. It's really important to get like a big evasion body armor with fizz taken as elemental. It makes you a lot more tanky. In terms of your implicits, apologies, Craft of Exile doesn't let you put two implicits together that are auras because it thinks they clash, but they don't. So for your Searing Exile mod, you want increased effect of non-curse auras. For your Eater of Worlds, you want increased effect of whatever aura you're running for damage. So I normally run Haste, so you'd want increased Haste effect. If you're running Anger, obviously increased Anger. So we're going to move on to the rings. Now, we're going to be using a unique amulet that only gives us dexterity, and we need both strength and intelligence in the build. The way I'd recommend getting around this is buying two fractured rings. You want one with fractured intelligence and one with fractured strength, and you're going to craft them both the same way. These should be very, very cheap, and they don't have to be a high roll. Even if you can only get tier three fractured, that's still going to be enough. Then what you're going to do is you are going to use Harvest and craft Chaos Reforge on this item until you basically hit a ring that looks good. You're looking for maybe an extra resistance and some life. So this is an example of a ring I crafted within four to five Harvest rerolls. It's given me Lightning Resistance, 
it's giving me chaos resistance because I'm using chaos reforge and it can only roll chaos resistance from that. And then basically a prefix of a little bit of mana and I've then crafted some life. You don't need minus mana cost of attacks on this build because of the reduced mana cost we're going to get elsewhere. So really you're just looking for a ring with big intelligence on one, big strength on the other, chaos res on both and life. And this is going to fill out a lot of the gaps that you might have defensively in the build on your chaos resistance. If you can fit it in, the taming is a really, really good ring. It offers resistances and an absolute ton of damage. It doesn't have a life roll, but early on, it's a big, big damage increase. Now, that can be quite expensive, but I do think if you want to get damage into the build, run one rare ring and then the other ring make it a taming ring. There's a couple of uniques that I'd recommend using on the build, and they're both very cheap. As mentioned already, we're going to be using a Hiri's Truth Amulet. It is a very common item, so try and get a roll with big crit multi. You're going to anoint high voltage to get 100% crit chance against shocked enemies. And this amulet is going to serve you very, very well for DPS. It gives you Culling Strike. It gives you some mana reservation efficiency to help with the level 30 precision. What you will find, though, is it does use more mana than a standard precision at level 20. So you do need to make sure you've got the mana nodes on the skill tree and the mastery before you run this amulet. The unique boots we're using, again, these should be one chaos, are three-step assault boots. They give Raider an absolute ton. So we get 100% increased evasion during onslaught, and we have permanent onslaught. We get 30% chance to avoid elemental ailments when we're phasing, and we're always phasing, and it comes with pretty decent evasion and decent movement speed. The good thing about these boots is because they're so cheap, you can buy some, corrupt them, try and get a decent implicit that's going to help with the build. I would recommend as a staple these two unique items. They bring so much to the build. So for your gloves, it's really going to depend on what sort of resistances you've got because we're using a couple of uniques and we're trying to stack damage on our quiver, which we'll go on to in a bit. So you might need to stack your gloves with resistances. Either way, I'd recommend getting a pair of slink gloves with fractured resistance. It can be cold, lightning or fire. You're going to craft that with another essence of resistance to get two resistances onto the build. And then I would recommend rolling until you get at least a mediocre third resistance and then craft life. So something like what's on the screen here would be perfect. For your implicits, you want attack speed as your X arc. And there aren't really any good e Worlds implicits because we're not going to need accuracy. So I would go for increased effective marks, but I wouldn't necessarily worry about rolling this if you're tight on currency. If you don't need as many resistances, there are some really good suffixes that you could craft on gloves. The one I would recommend is increased critical strike chance and increased elemental damage if you've crit recently. Moving on to the belt, I would recommend at the start to have a heavy belt because you might need the strength. And again, we need to pack resistances into this. Ideally, you want as many resistances as you should get, life, and then an open prefix to craft elemental damage with attack skills. So we've covered off all of your standard gear. We just need to go over the bow and the quiver. For your quiver, you need to stack damage into this item or you're probably not going to be dealing the type of damage that you need to. So things that you need on this quiver are big crit multiplier with bows, and then you want a combination of damage with bows, life, flat damage, and attack speed. Any combination of those is great. The more mods you can get on the item, the better. In terms of bases, you're going to want either a primal arrow quiver or a broadhead arrow quiver. The bow is where you're going to spend your money when you want to push to serious end game content, because as with any other bow build, it costs around six divines to craft what I would call an end game bow. But you don't need this to clear your atlas and get your first two void stones. So to start with, you want a bow with around 600 to 650 elemental DPS and around 8% crit chance. The way you're going to craft this item, we will actually do a demonstration for this. So let's assume this is at the beginning of the league and you don't have access to fractured items. All you're going to do is get a spine bow base that's at least level 75 because that can roll T2 elemental. So let's say we had an item base of level 78. All you were going to do is use deafening essences of wrath on the base. All you're looking for is another big elemental prefix and an open suffix. So we'll just roll a few times until we get something we like. I would want t3 as my other elemental so you're either looking for cold or fire and then all we're going to do is craft crit chance so if hit it here we've got our essence lightning tier 2 cold all we're going to do is craft crit if you have it unlocked 
I'd recommend crit chance strength and intelligence as again it helps us out with our attributes. Then what we're left with there is a bow with 670 elemental DPS and base crit chance of 8%. The attack speed is something you would ideally want but that's the kind of thing that pushes the bow up into an actual craft and to cost some currency. There will be processes in the written guide on how to craft your end game bow because I don't want to bog down um, this video because it may be that there's some stuff that's uncovered that makes either crafting or the item much easier and cheaper later on. And that covers off all of the gear. We're going to go through the flasks and the jewels very quickly and then we'll move over to the gem links. So for your flask, this is a selection that I recommend. You want a quicksilver flask. I recommend having increased attack speed as your suffix. You want an instant divine life flask that grants immunity to corrupted blood. You want a jade flask with increased evasion. You want a diamond flask with increased crit. And in my opinion, the next best flask is taste of hate for the defensive qualities, but it can be quite expensive early league. So replacing this with something like Ziri's Promise or a sulfur flask also works really, really well. If you want to put some jewels into the build, for rare jewels, I'd recommend looking for attack speed with bows, life and crit multi, but jewels do tend to be pretty expensive for bow builds. In terms of uniques, if you want a lethal pride jewel, which will give you some strength, some double damage and some intimidate, that is a massive boost to the build. You're going to slot it in this jewel socket here because we pick up a lot of nodes on the tree that covers the radius. You're looking for intimidate and double damage a roll with both would be amazing if you manage to pick up a lionized fall gem you can slot that in here and it will turn all of these dagger and all of these claw nodes into bow nodes it's something that is an alternative to cluster jewels but i don't really recommend you do it until you get to about level 90 because it is a lot of points on the tree i'll go through the gem links that i like to run in week one of the league I run with a ballista setup for boss damage, but you can run a mana forge arrow setup instead if it's something that you prefer. So in terms of your main six link, you want your Val Rain of Arrows. Don't worry about quality because it's going to be very expensive to get a quality Val Rain of Arrows because you can't use the vendor recipe anymore. So forget about quality on the gem for now. Just get Rain of Arrows Val. I support that with Mirage Archer, Increased Crit Damage Support, Added Cold, trinity and then inspiration the reason i don't run any damage with attacks is because having two red two green and two blue on an evasion base can be difficult to color if you can manage to get two two and two you would drop added cold for elemental damage with attacks in my bow i only really aim for five link blisters at least i don't think it's worth spending the money on a six link but you would just add any damage with attacks in as your sixth link so the links are fairly optional. It really depends on what colors you get on your bow and how many chromes you've got. So in this example, I had four green sockets in a red. So I've gone artillery ballista, added cold damage, focus ballista. I'd always have those ones. Because I had another green socket, I've gone hypothermia, which gives more damage against chilled enemies. Because we're doing cold damage, we're going to chill enemies. And then I've got inspiration. If you get another red gem, you would add in elemental damage with attacks. You could also substitute hypothermia for something like faster attacks. I run a life tap support, mark on hit, sniper's mark. We have a four link mana force arrow set up to give us frenzy and power charges. And that is frenzy, inspiration or life tap, power charge on crit, and then mana force arrow support. And then in the boots, I have my auras and my movement skill. So I have a flame dash, precision, grace, and haste. If you're running Harry's Truth, which I'm not on this version, you don't need precision because you get supplied a level 30 anyway. So you basically want two 50% auras and a precision somewhere. I say I run Grace and Haste, but you could run Anger instead if you wanted more damage. But I really like the speed of Haste and the attack speed, so they're the auras that I run with. And they're the simple gem links. There's going to be more details about how your gem links change throughout the acts and early leveling in the POB. But that is really what you want your end setup to look like at the end of week one. If you get more currency, obviously you can add in awakened elemental damage with attacks instead of elemental damage. You can add in things like awakened added cold. You can go and get 21, 20 gems. Lots you can do to increase the damage gradually. In terms of pantheons, I think you should always run Lunaris on mapping. It's just too good not to. You get 1% fizz damage reduction. So that's flat reduction up to 8% based on how many enemies are nearby, plus the same amount of movement speed. Once you've got it all filled out, you get extra chance to avoid projectiles, 6% reduced LA damage taken if you've been hit, and that includes with spells, 
and you avoid projectiles that's chained that's very useful because projectiles can chain off of all your ballistas and then it can get quite deadly. For your minor pantheon, it's really going to depend on the content you run. Pick the one that best suits the content that you're running. So if I'm doing lab, for example, I'll probably take either Soul of Ralakesh so that I take less damage when moving when I'm bleeding, or Soul of Rizlatha to make sure I get life last charges if I get stuck on a trap section. If I'm running Searing Exar Altars, I'm going to run Aberath because I want that burning ground immunity. The good thing about Raider, because we're element immune, we don't need to waste essentially a Pantheon on Brian King to make sure we can't be frozen and reduce the effect of chill. For Bandits, you're killing all. Two skill points is way too valuable to give up on this build. So what I thought we'd do is just talk through the playstyle very quickly as you run through a map, and then we will go on to the section where I'll show you what the build's like at certain levels of your progression. So this is in standard because this is a character I used in the Sentinel event and then at the end of the event it went over to standard. It is a character that is okay geared but I think in trade you can be much better than this on a few divines. So we'll go in and we'll do a Crimson Temple. Just a normal roll map so it is quite deadly. It's got Fizz's extra vulnerability and more monsters. We'll stick on our Siren Exarch and then we'll go. The key to this build is keep moving and keep firing. We don't really have any life regeneration. All of our sustain comes from life on hit and life leech. So even if you get stuck, just keep firing, don't panic. You're going to evade 95% of attacks. There isn't really a spell in a map that should kill you unless you've got a ton of extra damage on it and you just need to be aware of dots. So on this character, I've probably got less cows resistance than I want, so that is going to be a danger. And bleed and physical damage are definitely going to be a danger because of vulnerability. So we'll activate our flask and then we'll just go through the map and then we'll do the boss. It is literally keep your flask up and then click rain of arrows. There's no other buttons you need to use other than a flame dash every now and again uh, to get out of the way of things. So we'll keep going. And then we will run up and just go through and do the boss. If you find you come into a massive pack of monsters and you're a bit worried... Use one of our rain of arrows. It's going to slow everything down and get, really give you some help on clearing those packs. So we'll um, we'll just get through these and then we'll go to the end and kill the boss. As you can see, because it got phasing, it's so comfy just moving in and out of monsters. As long as you keep firing, if you get hit and it doesn't one shot you, you're going to get back up to full health so quickly. So we'll go and we'll do the boss. So drop your totems, two of our rain of arrows. And then just stand there. Job done. Boss down. And this is on a fairly scuffed setup because it was mostly SSF gear. But that's kind of the play style. You just use Rain of Arrows, move through packs, use your Vile Rain of Arrows if you get in trouble, and Flame Dash to get out the way of things that you can see might do some serious damage to you. So this part of the video is really only for people that are bothered about what the build looks like progressing through the map tiers. Um, so what I've done, I've put text on the screen for the gear i've got on at the moment but it's very very cheap the only thing that might cost you 10 c plus is going to be the bow everything else is just resistance gear a five link and then a one c pair of boots i've leveled to 80 or 76 just about to 77 not done uber lab yet we've obviously got the gems that we had in the campaign so none of them are leveled up yet so we're going to run a t10 out map to show you what it's going to be like if you wanted to stay let's say to 85 in yellow maps We'll run a quick map, kill the boss. Then I'll go and do Uber Lab. We'll level up a bit more. We'll use the same gear. We'll go and do some red maps. Then we'll level up a little bit more, keep the same gear again, and see what it's like pushing corrupted T14 maps. So Uber Lab will make it quite a bit more tanky because you get a big flat boost to evasion from getting Uber Lab. And we also get more onslaught effects, so we're going to be much quicker. And but overall, the build is still nice and quick and it is nice and smooth. We've probably got, with Flask up, I would think probably about 90% chance to evade. Haven't got any fizz taken as Ellie yet, but with 3.2k life in yellow maps, you should be all right as long as you avoid um, like double fizzes, um, elemental and stuff like that. You should be absolutely fine. Um, so I won't hang around in the map. We'll just show what it's like to clear. As you can see, it's fairly straightforward and simple. Nice and quick. Now, you might take the odd death, but at this stage, if you are pushing this tier map, like tier uh, item level 77, and you're not even level 77, you're going to be getting a lot of XP a map. So even if you die once every three maps or something you're not even going to notice um, the drop in xp because you're going to be getting probably almost half a level um each map while you're at sort of under 80 and the reason i'm testing it is because i want to not really take any lead mechanics on a league start i just want to progress my atlas 
maybe do the lead mechanic and see what that's like. Um, so we're going to kill the boss. And as you can see, because you use your vile rain of arrows, the boss will then be super slow. So if he's in a phase like that, where he's going to walk from one end of the arena to the other to try and position to attack me, he's not even going to get there because he's going to die before he has a chance to do anything. So that's a tier 10 map out very basic gear on a five link. I'll go and run Uber Lab, then we'll go and run some early red maps, and then we'll show some T16 maps. So I've just completed Uber Lab. I have leveled the character up to 79. So now we'll test on the same pretty bad gear and a five link. We'll go and show what a tier 11 corrupted map feels like for completion. The only thing you're probably really going to notice is singles target for bosses is going to drop off a little bit, but everything else should be okay. It's probably when you're pushing up to tier 14 that you might think that you want to make some upgrades if you want a more comfortable uh, progression, but it should still be doable. So we've got a lot of increased boss life on this and blind on hit. So this could be quite an uncomfortable bossing scenario, but it is what it is. Along with a massive soul eater there always helps. Oh, we had a map back there. We'll go and collect that. And I'm trying to just pick random maps. I don't want to go, oh, here's a T11 beach. Here's a T14 strand. Here's a tier 16 Cemetery, I want to do a mixture of maps that are both a bit awkward to do or have bosses that aren't particularly friendly and um, rather than just maps where the boss is super super easy and not dangerous so you can just stand there for like 15 seconds if you need to I want to make it so that we do a good variety of maps so that you get a good idea uh, of what the build is going to perform like um, so you can see the map in here so what I'll do is just cut forward to the boss if I die I will show uh, some footage if not I'll meet you back at the boss So made it to the boss unscathed. As you can see, decent amount of XP and that's nearly half a level um, just for this map. So even if we do take a death, which we might do with this stupid MGX on because I can't see what's going on. <laughs> and we've got lots of extra boss life, so this could be interesting. But we've just got to make sure we are comfortable. There we go. Job done. Uh, so that was a tier 11 corrupted map done. That was with, yeah, 45% increased boss up and tons and tons of extra attack and car speed. And this ridiculous MTX that I need to take off. I believe it's that. Let's remove that. Uh, so we'll fast forward and then we'll go and do a corrupted T4T map, hopefully on the same gear with a couple more levels in the bank. So what I thought we'd do instead of just showing our map showcase of a T4T map, is that I've just hit level 81. Apologies, I noticed for some reason my aspect was slightly off on the last few clips, so you wouldn't have seen my XP bar. Um, so at the moment, we're level 81 at 10%. The idea being, rather than show a showcase, I'll just go and run 10 or 20 T14 plus maps with this character as it's been this whole video, nothing added on. And then we'll show you the time it takes to complete 20 maps. I'll show you some highlights or so talk over why I think this build is really good defensively. And then we'll show the deaths, what we got out of it, and then we'll go and do a Guardian or Shape map just to finish off this sort of progression part of the build. So very quickly, we'll just snapshot the deaths. I think we had five in the campaign. And I think, yeah, we haven't died yet mapping. And so we've got five deaths. 
Uh, we'll go to played. Ignore this because I sit AFK in this account. Um, so we've got play time, 9 hours, 39 minutes. So I'll just go and record some footage, run some maps, and then I'll voice over the commentary and talk about the defenses of the build and try and kill sort of two aspects in one. So let's talk about some of the dangers on the build while some footage plays in the background. I did die twice in these 10 maps and they were both to the same sort of thing which we'll come on to when we talk about the dangers that you're going to face on this type of evasion heavy spell suppression type of build. Firstly, but then this is a case where a lot of builds is chaos and poison damage early on. If you're just gearing on a budget, you're very unlikely to have any or little chaos resistance. So things like big poisons, extra chaos damage and things like that can really hurt you. Mods that turn off recovery and leech are pretty bad for this type of build because we don't have any life regeneration. So our recovery purely comes from leech. If that gets turned off, it's doable, but it feels quite bad. Any rogue exiles with resolute technique will absolutely shred you. Resolute technique is a mod that basically makes your hits unable to be evaded. You can't critical strike though. So when you get these rogue exiles, if they hit you once, you're very likely to either die or be near death. The problem is every single hit will connect with you, even with your 95% chance to evade because of that resolute technique mod. There's not many of them. There's only two to three exiles that I've come across that have got it, but you can certainly notice it when you run into them. Degens like Burning Ground and especially Bleeds are really dangerous. Bleeds are physical damage and we don't have any fizz reduction or mitigation whatsoever. So you have to be very on point with your bleed flask and you 100% have to have something to remove bleed or you're going to have a really bad time. Now the last thing that has killed me twice in this is AoE physical attacks. Normally these AoE attacks have two portions to them. They'll have a strike portion or a damage portion and then I have a secondary AoE effect. I'm pretty sure that AoE cannot be evaded. So when you get bosses that have an AoE attack, so I ran into two. I ran into the Tunnel Trap monster, and I ran into the T16 channel boss, which has wings and sort of splats you in an AoE attack. Both these maps had extra AoE on them, and I think they might have had extra damage as well. So when I thought I was actually outside the range, I wasn't, and I got one shot by both of them. These are things that can be avoided. It was just something I totally forgot about as I was going about mapping. But they are maybe maps you want to avoid. If they are monsters that you know do big AoE attacks, once you've got that map done for completion, don't go back to it because you don't want to risk a death when you get into the 90s. Like at this stage, 81 to 88 really doesn't matter too much. But when you start pushing towards 90, the deaths start to really hurt your progress a little bit. So knowing what bosses are probably dangerous to you and which aren't is a massive help. So for me on the build, if I can avoid it, I will avoid bosses with chaos degens and bosses with big AoE attacks. Now the AoE attacks are telegraph and they're pretty easy to dodge. But if you're doing a corrupted map and it's got extra attack speed, extra AoE, it can be almost impossible to get out of the way because they'll just come out the ground, bam, AoE. You're halfway across the screen, but that extra AoE clips you and you die. They're really the only risk with the build. You have phasing. 100% suppression, 100% ailment avoidance, 95% chance of aid, and very, very good leech and recovery. So overall, it feels super comfortable to map, but as mentioned, there are odd scenarios that might bring you a death or two. This is a build I played in the event. So I think I played it in the second event, and I leveled up to 94 or 95. And considering you lose 50% XP per death, it shows that it's something that can be progressed on a very reasonable budget in a league start scenario. So what we'll do before we sign off the video is go over the POB and I'll just quickly run through the written guide. Warning now for flashbang, the written guide is on Word and it's not dark mode. So you're about to get blinded. So let's switch to have a look at that. So the League Start written guide is basically 20 pages of just follow it from page 1 to page 20 if you've never played the build. And it will sort you through your leveling, your early mapping and then getting through and getting your four void stones. There are content links on the left hand side along with links here if you wanted to use them but it's easier just to use uh, the left hand side here. So there's a link to the POB which I will update because that's still the old one. There's a link to my loot filters that I recommend you follow. There's going to be a leveling one and an early mapping one and then once we understand kind of what's valuable and what isn't I will get a mid tier and end tier filter set up and I will share them in the video description once they're ready but it's probably a few days into the leak. There's a few leveling tips that I would recommend for 323. Essentially, in Act 2, whenever you get access to the league mechanic, always go in 
and try and find the NPCs and find Oath of the Magi. This is a skill that you can equip with the first two points that you get and it gives you loads of different buffs. One of them is 30% increased movement speed if you don't have any gems in your boots, which you should be able to do as a sacrifice while you're leveling. So it's going to be a massive boost to speed. End game, the primal list is definitely the ascendancy that you want to take. But early on, there's not much point because you won't have anything to slot into the empty kind of jewel sockets that you put the gear in. So it goes through leveling uniques just in case you wanted to buy some when you're going through the campaign. It's got strategy overview and also how your damage is calculated and how you're going to get that damage early on. It goes through what to take in what act. All the food sort of at four or five then. Don't really need to go any further than that because you don't really add anything else to the build. It's got ascendancy order, a quick explanation of our reign of arrows. And then it's got guides on how you gear up when you first get to maps and what sort of gear you're looking for. What sort of changes you need to make to your flasks and gems as you add links. How to progress through to crit once you get to level 85. And then what your end game setup is going to look like. It doesn't include cluster jewels and a lion eye setup, but the path of building does. So what we'll do now is we'll run over to the path of building. So before we dive into the POB, I just want to quickly talk about the new ascendancies because the last one that looks super OP, you basically get these like gem tome type things that you put into your empty slots when you unlock them. And it looks like it gives you mini ascendancies from all of the classes. We don't know what they are yet, but we'll know more when the league launches. So I'll put some notes in the video description and in the POB if there's any that look amazing for the build. But one that I think will definitely exist, and is one I would look to put into the build, is Endurance Charge on hit. It will come from uh, the Juggernaut, and there's a node that says every time you get hit, you then get your maximum Endurance Charges one per second. It might be slightly different, it might be like a chance to get Endurance Charges. But hit counts as spells as well and all spells hit us so i would look to get that because it gives us a massive flat reduction to the physical damage that we take and we have zero armor anything that gives you speed projectile damage um, extra curse effect mark effect anything like that is really helpful because we're quite a generic build it's just an attack build with elemental damage there are tons of things that can benefit the build so keep an eye out but I will be streaming on Twitch, so you know you can always come along and ask me questions if need be. So the POB should be all in order. Now it's one that I've had for a couple of leagues and I've been amending as I'm going along. So there may be the odd error here and there, so please let me know if there's something that comes up that's a bit strange. So there's not many notes in the POB because we've got that written guide to refer to. There's just a couple of links if you need to. And there's just a comment that at end game, if you're not going to do actual boss bosses, you don't really need ballistas. So you can put in a six link mana forge arrow setup to give you some supplemental damage where you don't have to worry about dropping ballistas. But for Uber Elder and Maven, you're probably going to need the ballistas for your extra single target. So the POB has skills from level 0 all the way through to the six link crit gems. It has items from sort of your beginning five link map setup through to getting ready for red maps, switching to crit, and then what I would recommend be your kind of end game setup for getting Uber Elder, Maven done, and then farming whatever content you want. You can obviously progress the build further, get, you know, more damage on your bow, get better jewels and stuff like that. But this is ample enough for a league start build, in my opinion. There's also full trees. So we've got like level 1 to 18, goes all the way down to your crit swap at level 84, which is here. Then it's got your final crit setup, which is going to be level, we've got it at 96. Just take life nodes off if you've not made it. And then I've also added a cluster setup and a lion eye setup. These two are what you really want to aim for because they give you a lot more damage. Which one you pick really depends on how much everything is. In my opinion, the cluster jewel setup is better. If a lion eye's gem is two divines plus, it is not worth it. If it's one divine and less, I'd probably just go for the lion eye's setup. So the cluster jewels that you're looking for are ideally an elemental cluster jewel with prismatic heart, sadist and any other node at the back here. These can be quite expensive, like two to three divines. If they are too expensive, just an eight passive attack cluster is fine. As long as it's got three notables, just take the two that you need to get to your medium clusters and then you're fine. Medium clusters are massively powerful for bow build. So even if you have a large gem that you think might not be that efficient as long as it only takes you these three travel nodes to then get into your gems you're fine 
Your medium clusters both want to be the same. Eye to eye, because we're getting close to enemies with point blank and repeater. Same again on the other side. What I would recommend you do for your small cluster jewel is anger or haste, whichever one you're running, has increased mana reservation efficiency. It means you can then drop all these mana nodes up here with the mastery that we needed to fit in that extra precision from the amulet. And then here, it's up to you. You can just slot a rare jewel, or you could drop some nodes on the tree and you could put an Enduring Composure cluster jewel to give yourself endurance charges. You could put any small cluster you wanted in here or any rare or unique jewel that you wanted to put in there. This POB is likely to be changed as we lead up to League Start as there might be things I realize are wrong or need tweaking. So if it is something you want to use, same with the written guide, wait until League launch day before you make your own copies if you're going to because they are likely to change over the next few days because I don't think there's ever been a guide that I've bought out that was 100% correct and didn't need tweaking in one way or another. That's it for this build guide. I don't think there's much more I need to go through because there are going to be considerable written guides and path of buildings to go alongside with the build. What you'll get leading up to the launch is I'm probably going to record a full leveling run up to mid-tier maps and publish the whole thing to my YouTube channel so people can go and look at particular bits in leveling or progressing the campaign. There will be a video coming out about my plans for my Atlas progression and then just a few tips and tricks videos. I will be streaming for the majority of League Start. I think I'm away for the Saturday evening at League launch. Other than that, I'm free all day every day for the first week. So I'll be online on Twitch quite a lot. So if you see me live, drop in. I'm happy to answer any questions. Same with in the video description. I'll reply to every single comment if it's a question that isn't already answered in the video. Thank you very much for watching. Hope everyone has a fun league start. Take care and see you in the next one.